So we're reading from Philippians chapter 2. Reading from the NIV version, if you have your Bibles with you, or if you wish to look on screen, that would be wonderful. So Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in Lord, the Lord Jesus uh, to send Timothy to you soon. And I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see him or see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it's necessary to send back to you uh, Ephrodias, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take, take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him and the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. May God add the blessings and reading of his word this morning. Good morning, friends. Philippians. Last week, the book of Acts, chapter 16, records the roots of this church. Then nearly 10 years later, the Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome, and he writes a letter to encourage the church he planted a decade before. Paul, once known as Saul, a great persecutor of Christians, hostile towards anything associated to the name of Jesus. He is now a Christian, a prolific writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit penning a letter, a gift to the Philippian church, after a church member from Philippi came to, to him bringing money and donations to keep him alive and well. Despite being stuck in deplorable conditions, Paul exemplifies servanthood. Incarcerated, he is ministering to those outside of prison, 
and doing so joyfully. Although Paul was now a defender of the faith, persecution was rampant and heavy for Christians at this time in history. Believers would desperately long for encouragement. Persecution was becoming an everyday part of life. When a letter was penned by an apostle, it would lift the spirits of the Christian community. They would look for opportunities to read it publicly and have it read everywhere. It provided hope, spirit-inspired hope. And we all need encouragement today. Although we are not persecuted in ways that the early church was, yet we are persecuted. We might be mocked, intimidated, shunned, isolated because of our beliefs. As mentioned last week, we are also persecuted by being silenced. As Christians, we are losing our voice. It worries me that our highly free North American world, the global North, is on the slippery slope of silence. Church as we once knew it is becoming highly passe. This is persecution. More than ever, we must look to God and ask, help us to reach others in new ways, methods that do not sway us away from the biblical truth, but are creatively grounded in Christ inspired by his Holy Spirit. And yes, our global church must be encouraged and prayed for regularly. A shirt that bears a cross connected to Christ, statistically is illegal in 53 countries. It tallies up this way. It's restricted in 40 nations and 13 are considered hostile. May we never forget that our sisters and brothers in Christ are still persecuted physically in many parts of this world. Last week, we covered chapter one of Philippians, living as if God is in control, but not an easy concept when things aren't going well or suffering is heavy on you. When we watch global events and agonize over loved ones dealing with heartache, other hardships, we learn there is a big difference between saying God is in control and living as if God is in control. It is the difference between our theology and our actions. Together, like the church in Philippi, we can become a community that demonstrates God is in control by the way we live. So we looked at chapter one in three parts. We can learn how to live as if God is in control by taking on God's priorities. We saw Paul's example that he was gospel centric. And we asked ourselves, do we look at the outrageous events swirling around us in terms of their effect on God's plan? Or do we ask, why is this happening to me? As if things are out of control. And number two, we can learn how to live as if God is in control by trusting him for the outcome. Paul wrote to his friends in Philippi that what has happened will turn out for my deliverance. From this very important phrase, we learned that Paul understood God is in control in terms of outcomes, not events. So whatever the outcome, Paul was rock solid about the fact that he would experience glory and goodness from any set of events. And finally, we can learn how to live as if God is in control by receiving suffering. As a faith community or any community, this is difficult to fully grasp at times. A suffering theology is not a well-defined concept, yet we remember that Paul reminded us that the church unified during times of difficulty. So challenging, but a concept I pray will grow within you, allowing some peace during difficult times. Remember, we can be right where God wants us, humbly serving and living for our Lord, yet suffering might still head our way. So as we look at chapter two this week, we learn that Jesus is our model for living in troubled times. His model is not only the ultimate perfect way we can access the suffering concepts as Jesus taught us. Paul challenges us to live up to the example Jesus set, and we can do it. In order to truly serve and encourage others, love must be in the center of a servant's heart. I was reminded of the strong measures Jesus took, using love as the ultimate example after Peter's denial. Peter was a colorful servant, despite pulling his feet from his mouth so often, and did make a few miscues in in ministry. I think we can uh, find a few of those those in in our our scriptures. Peter, post-denial, 
was now pretty much useless and fully broken as a servant of his Lord until the awesome resurrection event and a day on the beach. Jesus masterfully reinstated Peter to the church while reinforcing his deep, unwavering love for him, despite the reminder every time crowing was heard. Imagine, every time Peter heard the cock crow, well after the first night, he would be bitterly reminded of his denial to his Lord, his dear friend. We need to grab hold of that love word to serve. Jesus specifically asked for Peter after his resurrection. It has been said that there was a great tenderness to the angel who attended the resurrection event. The angel said, gather the disciples and Peter to meet Jesus in Galilee. To look a little deeper, it was an extra request to ensure that Peter knew Jesus wanted him there too. Jesus reinforced this in such a special way. Richard Foster notes the great sensitivity in the words of Jesus given from the shoreline for Peter and those fishing with them. As they caught another load of fish supernaturally, Jesus demonstrates his enormous kindness, his servant heart preparing a warm fire and fish breakfast for the bone-weary disciples, his dear friends. After breakfast, Jesus takes Peter, Peter aside and the healing begins. The rebuilding occurs. The Greek has four words for love. Storge is the first, referring to human affection, more specifically between parents and offspring. The second, philia, more related to friendship, highly valued among the ancients. The third is eros, the relationship between lovers. The fourth is agape, which translates to charity. This was when the word charity carried much more weight than it does today. We might be able to expand this definition to, definition to a divine love, the kind of love we can only find from above, united in our human experience. Jesus helps rebuild Peter by asking him the questions, the definition of love in four ways, really. Simon, do you love me? Jesus is saying, do you love me with God's eternal, ever receiving, ever forgiving love? Peter, who was always quick to answer, was not quite as forthright in his response. He's beaten up emotionally and spiritually. The second time, Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me with that grace-filled, God-kissed love? A third time, Simon, do you love me? Simon, my beloved, do you even love me as a friend? With Peter's final affirmation for his love, with his love for Christ, Jesus says, feed my sheep for a third time. Three times Jesus commissioned Peter for ministry. Peter is now affirmed, rebuilt, encouraged, knowing his Lord loves him unconditionally and has commissioned him to do the work of the kingdom despite a horrible miscue and denying his master, his best friend. We can embrace this part of the gospels during personal trials and turmoil. And I see Paul demonstrated his love for the church in similar ways with a servant heart to share with the Philippians, despite his horrible predicament. He demonstrated the heart and love of Christ. In suffering, he wrote words of encouragement for them, selfless once again. Looking at Philippians chapter two and the idea of servanthood in tough times, I must borrow from friends associated to the Rotary Club, a nonprofit secular organization who have an incredible motto the back of their business card state, service above self. It's incredible to see the work they do without a, super, a spiritual connection. They helped me to understand service, sent me to places where I could embrace others who live in the margins, both overseas and right here in the Quarthus. Knowing the great work they do as servants without acknowledging Christ, imagine what is available to us, Christians who serve above self, giving all the glory to Christ, empowered to do the work by his Holy Spirit. It is exciting if we can truly embrace this. We look at the first four verses of chapter two. We are instructed that in the midst of difficulties that we should remember service above self. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. 
Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. We need to keep this in mind. These words are coming from an imprisoned man who did not really know his own fate. One of two things generally happened to a Christian in Paul's day, if released from prison. They were beaten and released, or they were released but executed, or beaten and executed. Not great prospects for Paul, yet he maintained a service above self attitude, writing this incredible letter that we read with delight every, even unto today. Remember, he was ministering to the jailer and I'm sure anyone that came his way. The ultimate example, of course, Jesus was on the cross. He focused on the Father's will and was concerned about the standing of those who persecuted him. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. We hear these words so often, every Easter and in many messages, but I pray they never lose their enormous power. This was not an insincere statement of a religious must do. Jesus, the sinless son of God, God incarnate, prayed in his darkest moment, Father, forgive them. He ached for them. He pitied them. He felt badly for them. We are not being physically crucified, and it's sometimes hard for us to forgive the smallest indiscretion against us. We might carry it with us for years or to the grave. Yet Jesus pled for his persecutors. He also bled and died for them. So no matter where we are in life, the good times are bad, we reflect on the image of Jesus Christ through an open, forgiving heart. When the world sees this, life changes in the most incredible ways. Doors open, and we actually feel better, both physically and certainly spiritually. I have been guilty of holding grudges and living with an unforgiving heart. When I remember to take that inventory and give it all to God, I live life 100% better. As difficult as it might be, the Holy Spirit is there for us. He will give us the strength to move past the tough issues. Forgiving can be a personal battle. So the great example of Jesus, the next few verses, 5 to 11, we hear one of the great songs of the early church. Some scholars believe that this passage was actually a worship song sung by the very first followers of Jesus. It is a song filled with challenge and wisdom for us today. Yes, there is some discussion as to whether this was a hymn or how it came to be, yet the beauty is this. Paul, in writing this to the Philippians, confirms to them, to all those who heard, and us today, that we worship our God, who is triune and remains at the heart of the Christian faith and distinguishes our faith from all other religions. It also becomes strikingly clear that Christ, who is already divine, acted in obedience to God the Father, sacrificing all for the good of a sinful humanity. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature, nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Six verses break down into three sentences. First, Jesus, he made himself nothing. Second, he humbled himself. And third, God exalted him. This early hymn is compared to steps into humility. Jesus is our example. He humbled himself living a life of service and then humbled himself even unto death. This is the path Jesus chose to walk. Bible scholar Gordon Fee tells us that this passage is the complete picture of what God is like. There is no other, says Fee. Here in Philippians, the ancient worship song, him writing, however theologians wish to define it, it does not leave Jesus in the grave. We see that the God the Father exalted Jesus and raised him to life. Indeed, the Father raised him high above every other name. 
but it's more than a worship song. The Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus is our example. Paul tells the church in Philippi to have the same attitude that Jesus had. During times of trouble or persecution, we are tempted to defend ourselves. When people misunderstand us at work, when people ridicule for our beliefs in public, when our own family members do not understand us, we face a temptation to argue and to dispute. But the Apostle Paul says that we should have the same humility of heart and posture as Jesus, our Lord. Four different times the Bible says, God gives grace to the humble, but resists the proud. I can't help but think of our brother Ken Wingett, a theologian in his own right, who shares a great deal of Dietrich Bonhoeffer with me at the church. Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. There is no place for triumphalism in our lives or in the life of the church. Exaltation is the Father's work, and it requires faith from us to trust that the Father will raise us up in his time and in his way. Therefore, my dear friends, in the following verses, as you have always obeyed, not only in your presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We read, we are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2.8. Yet it's the same apostle who said, we are saved by grace through faith, who also said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Has Paul changed his mind? It is the battle of contradiction sometimes, but Paul is not contrary whatsoever. What Paul is saying is that we have been given the gift of salvation, and having received the gift, our only reasonable response is to work towards imitating the example of Jesus. The takeaway is this. The words of Dallas Willard, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Again, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. So the last point is hold on and hold up. In this final passage, we discover that in hard times, blameless and pure people shine. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. After the hymn or worship song, he tells us to do everything without complaining or arguing. And this is true for both individuals and for the community of faith. To set aside complaining or arguing is a corporate discipline that is only possible when people realize the blessings of grace and salvation. We have been saved by grace. The ground is always level at the foot of the cross. There is so much freedom in Christ when we break away from the thorns of religiosity. Society still watches the church, churches and individuals. Many watch just waiting to say, you see, I told you why I don't like church. Consider the news right now and an enormous hurt over the residential schools and the fingers pointed at the Catholic church. How will we attract others to Christ first and the universal body of believers? If others see a faith community who really learn how to love, embrace love, welcoming all with a forgiving, service above self heart, the attraction would become contagious. Paul provides a final command in chapter two. He says, hold on to the word. This is an awesome, challenging command. But if we can hold on to the scriptural word of life, given to us by the Holy Spirit, we will also be able to hold out the words of life, offering them to our families, our friends, and our community. The second chapter of Philippians puts us in touch with the ancient worship of the earliest Christians and the very heart of what it means to follow Jesus. When Paul wrote this letter to comfort the brothers and sisters in Philippi, he pointed to Jesus as their example. The ultimate model then, and now, 
The heart of our faith is to follow the humble example of Jesus, especially in times of trial and persecution. His example of humility and service is within our reach. It is our calling, both as individuals and as a church community. Amen.